Stella Bosch, uh, I am in Somerset West's building. Um, just accept that. I've been helped by Sasha Marchinkovsky again, so grateful for that. And please accept that once again I have to chew chewing gum to keep my saliva up. Uh, just a couple of introductory remarks before we get the scriptures read to us today. Um, I received recently uh, as a WhatsApp a poster by, with a quote on it by a man called George Woodruff. I had no idea who he is, but look him up. He's quite a, an amazing man. But here's the quote anyway. The test of Christianity is not loving Jesus, but loving Judas. The test of Christianity is not loving Jesus, but loving Judas. So I'm following the lectionary, set readings for the Sunday of the year, and I'm trying to be faithful to Tony, who set this task for me. And it's a privilege to be with you, but these are hard scriptures. So while I'm enjoying being with you, it's been difficult to put these three passages of scripture uh, together. Each one is difficult, put them all together, and it's um, significantly harder. So please listen well, uh, work at it, not that you don't, but really please, um, and ask the Father to give me and you fresh and deep understanding uh, and then a willingness to do what we read in the scriptures. The test for Christianity is not loving Jesus, but loving Judas. Let's listen now as the scriptures are read to us. Genesis chapter 21 verses 8 to 21. Hagar and Ishmael sent away. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly, because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your maidservant, Listen to what Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the maidservant into a nation, also because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with a boy. She went on her way and wandered to the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down nearby, about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water, and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boys as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Matthew chapter 10 verses 28 to 42. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledged me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. 
Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 to 11. Dead to sin, alive in Christ. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? For don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin, once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You know that Judaism and Islam and Christianity all claim Abraham as the father of faith, father of the faithful, he's our common ancestor, the one who believed God, even if what God was saying seemed absolutely preposterous. In fact, it made Abraham's wife Sarah laugh out loud at what she thought was the absurdity and ridiculousness of what God had said. But pause for a moment, would you? When Jesus raised the daughter of Jairus, a little 12-year-old girl from the dead, and in the midst of the process, he said, she's not dead, but asleep. The Bible says the people around Jesus at that point in Jairus's house laughed at Jesus. He introduces his followers, and for us, all people for all time, that death is only a sleep, and we will be woken from it, and we will then receive rewards or judgment as he determines. Some laughed at that. Well, many still laugh at Jesus, um, but it's recorded that Abraham believed God. Sarah laughed, he believed. The following you should know, and um, nevertheless, I'm, I'm going to just repeat it, but it's there for us. Uh, Isaiah, um, um, Sarah falls pregnant. Oh, I'm really bad today. Um, Sarah can't fall pregnant, and she is old and troubled, and she says to Abraham, take Hagar, my handmaid, and basically see if we can produce children from uh, from her and then we'll have an heir for all our properties and whatever. Well, it happens. The first surrogate mother that we know of uh, in the scripture, certainly. And Hagar gives birth to Ishmael. You should know what happens then. Sarah falls pregnant. Oh. And sometime later, she sees Ishmael mocking. We're not told who he's mocking or what he's mocking, but we presume it's his little half-brother. And Sarah is filled immediately with rage, anger, fear, and tells Abraham, quote, get rid of this woman and the child. Sarah adds that Ishmael will never share an inheritance with Isaac. Just think about our own prejudices. Are children born out of wedlock worthy of the same treatment as those born in wedlock? 
Uh, I know I've struggled over the years with uh, people getting married for a second time and their children on one or both sides to try and persuade them that if you're marrying this person with children, you're taking the children on as well and they really should be seen by you. But boy, sometimes that just doesn't seem to make sense to people at all. It's just themselves. Well, Abe says it would be wrong to do this. Verse 11, Abraham thought it would be wrong to get rid of Sarah, uh, to get rid of um, Hagar and Ishmael. God says to him, don't get distressed about Hagar and Ishmael. I will also make his descendants into a great nation. And God has simply been faithful, reminding Abraham that he promised him you will have descendants and the descendants will become a great nation. The fact that Ishmael is a descendant, God is keeping that promise. In a sense, what's happening here is exactly what we read later on with Joseph and his brothers when they <clears throat> wanted to harm him. Genesis 50 verse 20, what you meant for ill, God has meant for good. Nevertheless, Abraham let Sarah have away. Hagar and Ishmael are sent away without the provision, uh, very little provision anyway, and certainly no donkey to look after them. The scene changes and <clears throat> we find young Ishmael crying in this wilderness place from hunger and thirst. And here's where the bomb goes off. Genesis 21 verse 17, God heard his cries. And he reissues the promise to Ishmael, I will make Ishmael into a great nation. He grows up and marries an Egyptian, so further and further away from the center of faith. I hope you'll remember that phrase, God hears the cries and sees the tears of his people. Well, many, 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 many years later, when Israel is now a big nation, but is in captivity, slavery in Egypt. Remember, Ishmael has married an Egyptian, so he's now in the pound seats, as it were. God calls Israel, uh, uh, Moses, and says, lead my people out of Egypt. I have heard their crying. It's like he hears us. He really hears the cries of the poor. He really hears the cries, the cries of the people who are rejected. Well, the Exodus happens. They get out of Egypt and make their way to the promised land. Here's the questions. What would have happened if Hagar had not been kicked out? What would have happened if, if Ishmael was not rejected? What, what would have happened if, if he never married an Egyptian, but kind of stuck around and, and married people who became Jews and were Jews? What would have happened if Ishmael and Isaac grew up to be brothers? Not just half-brothers, but brothers, and grew to love each other and respect each other in the fear of God who had made them. So when Jesus tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves in Luke chapter 10, should we laugh at that ridiculousness of the impossibility of that idealism? Really love our neighbors? I'm not sure where you live, but I, I, I don't even know all the neighbors' names in my complex. There's only 20 houses. I've got to check through the list. And I've been calling one man, Jimmy, for years, uh, because he looks a bit like my dad. His name was Jimmy, and I discovered his name's Johnny, and he's never corrected me for seven years. So, pst. So when the story of Jesus telling us to love our neighbors gets into a parable to explain this to us, he chooses as the kind neighbor, a Samaritan enemy of the Jews, hated second class, treated less than second class by the Jews. There was a tradition that, or an understanding at least, that, that, that Jews and Samaritans wouldn't even use the same dishes the part that day is we used to keep separate dishes for black or colored people. Quite shocking. So how much more uh, is this rule of Christ Jesus to be laughed at or feared or just simply put into practice? Love your neighbor as yourself. 
So what gets in the way of us loving our own neighbor? What got into Sarah that she couldn't love? The very woman she had offered to her husband. Well, it's the big I in sin. Again, you, you know this and you certainly should. The big S-I in sin. Self-interest, self-preservation, self-indulgence. So let me move from the Genesis passage now to the Romans passage. And I plead with you to ask the Father and for your sake and for mine that we would really believe Christ is in us. Because that's what Paul is trying to teach the Romans here. That you have at work in you now the same power of resurrection that raised Jesus from the dead. Working in our mortal bodies. And he says we're dead to sin because we are united with Jesus. Dead to sin. I just think it's an impossible possibility. Sounds great, but man, as he himself says, sin seems to be crouching at the door waiting to devour us. It's not a laughing matter. Abe believed God. Sarah laughed at God. Abraham and Sarah chose their son over Ishmael, though it was Sarah's desperation for a child that set this conundrum in play. The Matthew passage is full of hyperbole. It's an over-the-top statement about impossibilities. How can we love God more than our own flesh and blood? I mean, is, does God really want me to love him more than to love my wife and my children and, and my grandchildren? Does Christ Jesus really divide son from father or surrogate son from his own father? Is he really a jealous God? Wanting us to love him more than anything else. Do we really lose our lives by trying to save them? <laughs> Spoiling ourselves a little bit, looking after our money for ourselves and for our old age. Is that really loss in the end? Is John, old John now, in his 90s, is he not 100% correct when he says, if you can't love the people you see, how can you love God whom you've never seen? So you know, you know the Bible's full of these examples and urgings and commands and suggestions that we love outsiders as we love ourselves. To love outside the barriers of class and culture and gender and religion and economics and politics. So. Let me end. What do these three readings from Genesis and Romans and Matthew, what do, what do these three readings make me want to do? So here's my answer and, and perhaps it will help you. <clears throat> they make me want to be unlike Sarah. And that's pretty negative to choose as a role model someone that you don't want to be like and say anything but that. I remember being a very abusive young uh, student uh, for the ministry, working in a church for a summer vac, and after the three months in the church, the minister said, so what have you learned? And my arrogant reply was, only a few things I'll never do in my own ministry. Well, you know, that didn't go down too well, as it shouldn't have. But seriously, the passages together make me want to be unlike Sarah. Together the passages urge me to love and to love with gentleness. To be unlike Sarah was towards Hagar and Ishmael. To love with respectfulness, unlike Sarah and her treatment of Hagar and Ishmael. To love with generosity and no questions asked about who is to be receiving. So I'm urging you, as I've tried to model for myself and the congregation I've served, to see Jesus when you look at others and to be Jesus to those people. So here's a challenge, Stella Bosch. I urge you for at least one week, just seven days and just once a day for the seven days. Be unlike Sarah and make it your goal once a day, just for seven days, to be loving, kind, generous, respectful to someone unlike yourself. In a sense, say to the Lord Jesus, Lord, let me wash your feet 
by loving these others. Perhaps even someone who may even be an enemy to you. They don't like you, you don't really like them. Perhaps someone completely different from yourself. So there's a challenge. Put these passages together and come out saying, how do I love my neighbor? Not like Sarah, but like Jesus. So perhaps we should be praying, Lord Jesus, ask me and I'll give to you. Seek from me and you will find in me, Lord, a willingness to serve you. Lord Jesus, knock on the door of my heart and I'll open it to you. Little addition from Paul. He says, let your gentleness be seen at all times because Jesus is near. And so once a day for seven days, Stellenbosch, be gentle, especially with those who are unlovely. And try and keep this all to yourself. If by any chance it becomes known what you're doing, others are aware of what you're doing, and some maybe even in your own family laugh at you like that's just ridiculous to do that. Well, let that big eye in sin not get in the way. Don't laugh at the things of God. Simply go out and do what you urge to do. I wanted to end with this story. It puts me in a good light, but that's not the point. The point is something beautiful happened when I tried to be like Jesus. So there's a caretaker in our little block of 20 houses. He's deaf, speaks very badly as a result. He's as thin as a piece of spaghetti. He's absolutely thin. It's hard to communicate with him. And uh, I, I asked if I could buy him some warm clothes for winter. Well, through various bits of communication, uh, that was agreed. So I'm taking him off to um, Angry Mark in Durbanville, to the Johnson's clothing store to buy him some good winter clothes. And as we drive in there, I say to him, his name is Breck Dance, by the way. What a strange name. But I say, Breck Dance, have you eaten breakfast yet? No, he says. Uh, I said, have you eaten anything this morning? No, no, I haven't. So, okay. I said, have you had coffee? Yes, I managed to make some coffee uh, when I got to the complex. So that's fine. I don't, I don't tell him, but I pull up at a garage that I know has got a, a, a takeaway, and I know they have piles, literally piles of breakfast rolls made every day, and they're there from about 7 to 9. And so I go in and I buy two breakfast rolls for break dance, and I buy one for myself. I hadn't eaten breakfast. I get back in the car, I close the door, and I take out my breakfast roll, and I say to him, break dance, I've, I haven't eaten, so I'm going to eat. In that bag are two rolls, you can eat them whenever you like. So he stares at me, I begin eating, and slowly the hand goes in and he pulls out a breakfast roll, and he scoffed it down in about three bites. And I realized, he's not just thin, he's really hungry. Between mouthfuls, he says, I'm eating with the duomini. <laughs> and then smiles to himself. I thought, this, this is amazing. Anyway, we do our shopping, we get back. <clears throat> the caretaker uh, goes and deposits the clothes with the woman who's the secretary of our building. She comes to me later on and she said, did you buy Break Dance breakfast? I said, yeah. She said, you know, he came home with all his clothes and the first thing he wanted to tell me was, I ate with the Duomini in the car together, both of us with our hands. Hey, his clothes cost a lot of money, and I know he's grateful for them, but what he loved was sharing a meal and being treated as an equal. A week or so ago, there was an earthquake in Gauteng. My daughter was woken. She said it was an unbelievable noise and shake. But the news reports told us that some people slept through it. Stellenbosch, <laughs> please don't sleep through these three words from Scripture today. Be unlike Sarah and love with generosity and gentleness and kindness and respect those who are not like you. Amen.